God told me, hey, okay, you're okay. What about these people? There's mm-hmm. somebody else out there who wants the same thing that you wanted. You wanted to heal and not be medicated. Because we all know medication does not heal you. It only shuts you up. It stabilizes your mood. But what about getting to the root of it, you know? Repeat after me. I bring more than diversity. I bring irreplaceable perspectives. Hey friends, my name is Whitney and I'm the host of Impostrix Podcast, the show that validates professionals of color navigating imposter syndrome and racial toxicity in their career. Join us and be validated. You got this. Well, welcome to Impostrix Podcast. I'm Whitney Lee, your host. I'm here with Shanti and I... Love this conversation already um, because of the conversation that Shanti and I, ha- I had during the pre-recording. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about navigating and dealing with microaggression in the workplace as Black women and about finding mental health support also as Black women. So with that, I would love, Shanti, if you can introduce yourself. Tell us what identities you're bringing to this space. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me, Whitney. My name is Shanti Refuge, and I'm a certified mental health coach, mental health advocate, keynote speaker, and author. And I help women to release, heal, and live their best lives through guided journaling. Mm. And that's like, you know, when you hear somebody say that, you got all these questions. Like, I got all these questions, but I know I want to keep us on two specific questions. Okay. <laughs> um, and so I'm not going to go into all of the things that I wonder about you. Um, but can you share with us how, your racial identity? How do you identify? I am an Af- African-American female. Okay. Okay. <laughs> And so you're a mental health coach and briefly, so we've had other <clears throat> coaches and then we've had therapists on the show. Can you tell us what your understanding is of the difference between a mental health coach versus a mental health therapist? A mental health therapist is a licensed practitioner who can diagnose you with, you know, whatever, um, Diagnoses there are pertaining to, uh, let's see, de- severe depression, anxiety, uh, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. So anything on the axis, they are able to actually diagnose and treat you. They can't prescribe you anything, but they can do that. A mental health coach is me. I'm certified. I cannot diagnose you. I mean, I can in my head, but I can't tell you. And <laughs> <laughs> I help you with, let's say you come to me diagnosed and you say, hey, and that's one of the pre-questions that I ask a pre- on my assessment. Have you been diagnosed with uh, anything? And if they say, yes, I've been diagnosed with severe anxiety and depression, cool. Then, you know, then I help you with that. If someone comes to me and have not been diagnosed, but I can clearly see that they have a diagnosis, then I refer them to a therapist to get the diagnosis and the further help that a therapist can provide more than coaching. A therapist helps you with things from the past. So they help you to go back to the past and address whatever happened in the past to get you where you are today. A mental health coach, me, I help you where you are right now and we move forward. Yeah. And I've shared this um, in other conversations that it's it dawned on me after I learned the difference between mental health coaching and mental health therapy, that a lot of what I've used therapy for was really coaching. And so I'm a firm believer in mental health coaching, um, particularly when we're talking about what we're going to be talking about today, which is microaggression and some of the toxicity that we can experience in the workplace. It it may certainly trigger us. It may trigger some things for us, whether that's um, memories or events or feelings that we've had, you know, in this lifetime, but it can also trigger uh, intergenerational trauma and trauma response that maybe we don't know, we don't know what's going on, um, per se. And so I really have used mental health coaching, both relating to just mental health stuff that was going on, but also as I've navigated some difficulty um, in my career environments. And so coaching is not your first career. Is that right? 
That is correct. My first career is I'm a budget analyst for um, a mental health organization. <laughs> I've been here for almost, it'll be 20 years in September. Oh, wow. So you're of the generation that stays at a job. You know, I had no intentions on staying here that long. You know, <laughs> back then when I started in 2005, I said, okay, I'm going to be here two years and I'm out. That was like every job I had, I gave it a two year and then I'm out. And I have done that up until I got in, you know, but when I first started, I was not in the position that I'm in now. So mm -hmm. I think that's what has kept me here so long. So every two years I would transfer to a different department. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> so, uh, but I haven't transferred from a department since 2009. So I've been in this actual position <laughs> since 2009. Okay, awesome. <laughs> So yeah, I want to know all about um, when we were doing our pre-conversation, our pre-recording conversation, we started talking about how we've experienced microaggression in the workplace. And so I really want to start by diving in there because I know that you have at least one experience um, that you were telling me about that <laughs> really took you down some, some paths um that can be difficult to to navigate for for many of us and i think many of us can relate so what has your experience been um in your profession as a black woman who's having to navigate you know these relationships with colleagues now i'm learning for 20 years so that means you experience something and then you stay through it so t tell us about that actually i did not experience microaggression until i got into this position Mm. And it, uh, I'm in uh, the information technology department. So, you know, we're all the, the, you know, IT nerds, you know, we like, you know, numbers and well, I don't like numbers, but you know, but my specific part of the uh, information technology is I um, assign devices, you know, iPads, iPhones, we're Apple people over here. So um, <laughs> we were in a staff meeting uh, I want to say maybe two years ago, we were in a staff meeting and um, we were reporting to the director of information technology, like we always do, still do it today. And in the meeting, something was brought up and I did not understand the question or understand my role in it. And so I asked, you know, I, I mm -hmm. came from being afraid to ask questions to, okay, now I'm asking. And when I asked the question, a um, peer who don't know they appear, uh, <laughs> that's one issue, uh, mentioned, made mention, after I asked my question, they made mention that I, I, it was a learning curve. And I took that as, you know, as it was, because I know you were talking about me, you just didn't say my name. But I felt like it was a legitimate question, but you know, but they said it was a learning curve and blah, blah, blah. I don't even know what else he said after that because when I heard learning curve, I shut down immediately because in my mind, I'm saying, he's calling me dumb. Then he calling me a dumb black girl. And you know, and I didn't want to address it in the meeting because I didn't want to be seen as the angry black woman because you know, mm -hmm. you know, that's another thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, of course he's Lily White. And uh, so I shut down. Like I, when I say I shut down from the meeting, I quit listening and I just immediate tears. I'm crying hysterically. Mm. And we were working from home back then. And my wife is like, what's wrong with you? Cause she's sitting right next to me doing her job. And she's like, what's the matter? I'm just like, don't talk to me. And I'm just, I mean, I was hysterical. I could not control it. And I ended up having to, you know, take something. And I don't mm -hmm. like taking anything, but I was so out of control that I had to. And um, it, it made me feel away. It made me feel like I wasn't good enough or I wasn't smart enough or I didn't deserve to be in the room because that's mm -hmm. how that person likes to treat anyone who isn't, okay, first of all, information technology, full of men. That's one thing. It's only, it's like 60 something, people in this department and there's only three women and I'm one of them. Mm. <laughs> so it's like, and he, and, and like I said, I've been here a long time and this new person knew, I think he had only been here like three or four years. 
I'm like, how dare you come here and tell me, you know, but I didn't want to be like that because I would have been escorted off the premises. Um, and I talked to my uh, coach about it because I have a coach. I talked to my coach about what happened and she said that was microaggression. And I told her about all the other things, like anytime I would bring something to the table, he would be the only one to, you know, shoot it down. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You know, and I learned later on that it was personal. Like, he didn't like me because I talk and I don't just say, okay, whatever you say and go do it. No. And, you know, I let the fact be known that, you know, you're not my superior. We're peers. You have people that report to you and I'm not one of them. <laughs> so, yeah, I was able to handle it once I learned what that was because I had never experienced that before. And once I learned what it was and what he was doing, I knew how to take him. You know, and at this point, I don't even talk to him at all. And that's for my mental health and for me to keep my job because I, I like my job. But if I ever have to work with him one on one or in a team with him or if I even have to talk to him, I probably wouldn't be here. You mentioned a couple of things that I want to circle back on. Mm -hmm. First is you said a peer who didn't know he was a peer and I had to chuckle. <laughs> Because yeah. this is something that we can all relate to. I know I can relate to um, the point where we are holding a position, but because someone else doesn't hold us with high regard um, or doesn't consider us their equals, all of a sudden they're treating us that way. Okay. And the other thing that you said was around how you internalized what had happened in that situation. You said that you had shut down, you had stopped listening in that meeting. Mm -hmm. And this is a common reaction that we have when we are, I mean, you were in effect shut down by him, uh, by his comment insinuating that you were not smart mm -hmm. and then you having to navigate internally uh, the answers to these questions that you're asking, do I belong here? Am I smart enough? Is he talking about me? Did something that I say, like, was this a dumb question? Um, mm -hmm. Am I the only one in this room that doesn't know what this person is talking about that I need to ask a question? And as the question asker that I am, you know, I can certainly relate to the experiences of looking around because somebody's saying something everybody around me is nodding their heads and I'm like, but did I miss something? Like, why, why are y'all not like, what is this person talking about? And so then asking the question, but then getting people rolling their eyes or here goes Whitney again with the questions or whatever, <laughs> whatever the case may be. And I'm fortunate that in my roles, I've had colleagues, you know, afterwards in those situations come to me and say, I'm so glad that you asked that question because I didn't know what, that person was talking about, I didn't know what we were supposed to do. I got lost on the directions or whatever the case may be. But it's what struck me about what you said was how seemingly easy it is for some people to not only make these types of comments that are microaggressions without second thought, mm -hmm. but also the impact that that has on us in the moment. So much so that we're not even, we're not able to continue to participate in that moment. Yeah. I um, first talk a lot about, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was like, that's the first and last time I let that happen. Mm. Yeah. And I think for myself, I'll say, I try and when something like that does happen, because it does happen, yeah. I try not to let it take me out of the picture altogether. Because how I respond is, is a response and I have a choice in my response today. And sometimes, particularly when this is the first time or maybe if it's an interaction with somebody who actually is a supervisor or who holds more power than I do in the space, it can be jarring. It can feel like I'm being put in my place. And I try not to internalize that message mm -hmm. because that's giving them what they want. 
Yes. You are absolutely right. That's why I said that was the first and last time that happened. <laughs> you know, if I would have responded how I wanted to respond, I probably wouldn't have a job. <laughs> And that's the other thing, right, that we as Black women have to navigate. Mm -hmm. I've done an episode that we'll be releasing um, in March on strong Black women and angry Black women, Mm -hmm. those two stereotypes that we have to navigate. And it's like, on the one hand, being the strong Black woman is kind of the gold standard. Like, we're expected to be able to take other people's bullshit and with grace, (laughs) without, you know, necessarily standing up for ourselves or doing what others would call making a scene. Um, But then the moment that we respond appropriately, it's like all of a sudden now we're a threat because we're angry. And what we're exhibiting in terms of our anger is attributed to our personality instead of to the situation itself that caused us to, to be angry. And so it is a very uh, difficult situation to be in when you're trying to choose, at least for me, when I'm trying to choose between the reaction that I actually want to (laughs) give versus the reaction that I feel safe giving because maybe I need to protect my job today. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was me. You know, just be quiet, Shanti, because you know, if you say what you really want to say, you probably won't have one. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I wasn't ready to give up my job, especially not letting him have that power over me to just go berserk like I wanted to. I just be quiet. Mm -hmm. I put myself on mute. My camera was off anyway. So that was a great thing. And, you know, I just went on mute. Didn't say nothing. Didn't respond. Yeah. Did you have an opportunity or was any support within your organization, your company available to you? Not at the time, no. That's why I had to call my coach. Like, uh, mm-hmm. this happened. And she was, oh, no, he should not. Have. I mean, she had to tell me what he did was wrong and that it wasn't anything wrong with me asking a question. It was a legitimate question. Don't, and I, I used to be the one, how you say, used to be nodding my head like I knew what was going on, but really I had a question. I quit doing that. And mm-hmm. so now I'm standing, advocating for myself by asking a question because I didn't know the answer to it. And this is the response you give me. <laughs> mm-hmm. so, yeah. And I yeah. I just chose to be quiet. I didn't, I know, you know, after talking to my coach, I realized I didn't do anything wrong. And what he did was wrong. Right. And I think sometimes the nonchalant nature that we deal with those situations, either as an observer um, or as someone's supervisor who's, who's watching. So yeah. So an, as an observer, mm-hmm. when we don't speak up about those situations and just kind of let them happen and keep it moving. For me, it really feels like moments of gaslighting where then I start to question myself, am I being overly sensitive? Mm -hmm. Is this a dumb question? Should Mm -hmm. I already know this? Why don't I know this? Instead of the fact, the simple fact of the matter, which is, for whatever reason, and for any reason at all, a person said something, I'm not sure what they mean, and I need clarification. We should feel safe to be able to ask for clarifications and to be able to ask for the things that we need within our workplace. And when we're not able to do so, that does create an environment where we have emotional non-safety, where it's not safe um, emotionally or psychologically. I wonder... um, so after your coach told you what you were experiencing, what, what you were going through, how did you then approach the workplace? Or did it change at all for you, how you approach those, the workplace or that type of situation? The person, because nobody's ever done that mm-hmm. to me. It's only this one person, because everybody else, mm-hmm. you know, they love me. He cannot stand mm-hmm. my ass, and I do not care. <laughs> mm-hmm. And... Um, you know, I just, I, I don't interact with him at all. At all. He says, good morning. Is what I want. <laughs> but I don't, you know, because I know it's fake. You showed me who you were back then. So I'm going to believe that person. So no, no interaction at all whatsoever. 
at all. Yeah. And then I learned that he, I would have a question about something and he would shoot it down because it came from me. But when I told the, I told the idea or had the question uh, with someone else and I said, oh, let me go ask him. Oh, yes, that's a great idea. Oh, yes. Da, da, da. So that told me it was me, which means yeah. it's, it's a him problem. I'm it's not- a him problem. Yep. I love that. And we should be internalizing that. Like when we are in these situations where we're having to question whether or not we belong because of how somebody else has treated us, I've really been working hard to reframe that as that's not a me problem. This is not imposter syndrome. This is not me feeling like um, I don't have what I need intellectually and like I'm faking you know, how, how smart I am or how engaged I am with this subject. No, this is other people questioning me. And so I'm not going to internalize that as my own self-doubt exactly. or my own non-ability to do a thing. Instead, we'll just call it what it is, which is that you, person, whoever, uh, have an issue with me or think that I don't belong or think that I'm an imposter. And that's not my problem. And so in your approach, you know, I feel like you're lucky that you, you don't have to encounter this person. You don't have to work with this person anymore. Um, But some, (laughs) yeah, some of us do. And so I wonder, do you see, do clients um, come to you with these types of issues? And if so, how do you suggest that they work through them when you're still having to work with somebody that's been problematic in the past? So far, I have not had a client with that issue. I can't wait till I get her, though. Oh, I can't. Wait. <laughs> what are you going to tell her? What are you going to tell her? I'm going to tell her my experience and, you know, let her know. I mean, if she's wrong, yes, I'm going to say, okay, girl, you were wrong. But if they weren't, then I am going to uplift them and let them know, you know, and, and show them how to deal with it. Because I had to write a whole letter. That's how I dealt with him. I wrote a whole letter to him in my journal and I'm good now. Mm. <laughs> yeah so what what was that exercise like of writing the the letter was that like a releasing yes. process okay everything that I wanted to say to him I said it in my journal to him I addressed it to him in my journal okay mm. fine mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> and now it doesn't have that power over you to shut you down no never again will I let him or anyone else you know, mm. for, fool me once, shame on me, fool me, no, what is it? Fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame mm-hmm. on me. No, it ain't mm-hmm. gonna fool me twice. That was his one and last time. It won't happen mm. again. <laughs> good, good, good. Okay, so I, I am grateful that you shared this with us because I think sometimes when we talk about microaggressions and we talk about race or when we talk about being a woman or whatever our, our identities are, it can be difficult to be concrete about a specific situation. And sometimes that's because of the gaslighting Mm -hmm. of like, we know that we experienced something, but we've internalized that other people think we have not. And so now when it's time for me to share about my experience, I don't have the words for it because I've been told that that actually wasn't a thing. So I'm I'm grateful that you were willing to share with us um, about this. And I want to transition to my next question, which is just about mental health. Because again, you and I discussed this before our recording, the stigma that our community, um, Black people, African-American people have in the United States around receiving mental health services, mental health care. Um, And I know from our earlier conversation that you're somebody that has received mental health um, services. And so I wonder if you can share with us about that experience and whether or not you had to overcome um, a sense of stigma around needing those services. So uh, I guess I'm gonna answer your question within my story. Um, Back in 2018, I experienced a nervous breakdown. However, at the time I was experiencing, I didn't know what was wrong with me. You know, I was going berserk. 
literally I was crying, I was screaming, mad. It was just like all of these negative emotions, they were just coming, coming. And I couldn't stop it. I couldn't control it. I even if I tried to be happy, I could not fake it. It was it was just you who knew who you were getting and i thought it was just a funk you know how sometimes we wake up um i must be about to start my cycle i'm acting like a bitch or whatever you know i thought that's what it was and but it lasted it, it lasted longer than normal and it took me maybe a month to say okay shanti <laughs> something's wrong but i didn't know what so i went to my family practice doctor and I said, um, hey, you know, I'm, I'm acting like this. I'm acting weird and I don't like it. And she said, oh, you're just depressed. Let me get some antidepressants. I'm like, I don't want no damn antidepressants. But, you know, I took them because I trusted her. That's my doctor. And uh, she said, come back in six weeks and let me know how it worked for you. A whole while, the six weeks, I'm still acting you know, so there was a month, six weeks of me acting crazy. And I went back, told her, uh, this ain't working. And she said, oh, let me give you a stronger dose. And I'm like, I don't want this. But I'm going to take them. I took them, whatever. And six more weeks, they did not do nothing for me. I was getting to the point where I was finding myself about to be physical with my aggression. You know, instead of just... And I'm like, okay, Shanta, you can't go to jail now. <laughs> Cause that's nope. Where, that's where I was cannot not, have that. Yeah, because I knew something was wrong. I just did not know what. And so she referred me to a psychiatrist. And I'm like, wait, people don't see no damn psychiatrist. But you know, I'm gonna go ahead and go. You know, because when I think psychiatrist, well, when I used to think psychiatrist, I used to think white woman laying on the couch, crying, mm. drinking wine, popping pills. You know, that's. The image I had in my mind, I, like, I don't want that to be me. So I went ahead right. to a psychiatrist, though, because I just, I didn't know how much longer I could not put my hands on somebody mm -hmm. <laughs> in a bad way. And um, the psychiatrist gave me antidepressants. She gave me stronger ones. And I told her, I said, I don't want antidepressants. Why do y'all keep trying to drug me? I do not want the drugs. I want to know why I'm acting like this. What brought this on? So she referred me to a therapist. It took me on my third therapist, not the first one, not the second one, but my third therapist. It took me my third therapist for her to actually sit down, talk to me and get me to um, talk about issues that I don't even know I had, you know. So it was wow. my third therapist who diagnosed me with severe anxiety and depression. And we use talk therapy and we use journaling. So when she first introduced journaling to me, I'm like, I don't want to journal. I, I mean, I was against everything. I was like, I don't want to white people shit. I don't want to do that. I ain't got time to journal. But she had to tell me that it is a difference in the type of journaling that she wanted me to do versus the type that I had in my head. And so um, she went further to introduce me to guided journaling which means these are specific questions that are being asked. And I just write the answer down. That's all. That's okay. I'm going to try this. You know, I ain't with it, but I'm going to try it. And I, mm -hmm. try it. and I use guided journaling for maybe two weeks straight every day. And I started feeling better. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm not mad as, as mad as I was. I'm not crying like I was. I'm not this. I'm not that. And you know, I, you know, would report back to her and she would be like, I told you, <laughs> like, you know, journaling works. All you have to do is answer the questions. And yes, it works. So what I did, and I had a lot of issues um, through talk therapy and guided journaling. I learned that I had childhood issues, issues from being a teen mom, issues with being a single mom. I had all kind of stuff going mm. on. That I was not talking about, you know, because. Mm -hmm. You know, I was raised, you know, don't tell nobody your business. So right. what, what are we doing with our business? You know, you know, nobody to talk to about it or talking to the wrong person. You know, when you think you can confide in someone, it's like you think of a family member or your homegirl or, you know, but those people are listening ears, but they can't help you. You know, mm -hmm. and what I needed was help. 
and uh, I got the help that I needed through the therapy and guided journaling. And um, once I saw that it was working for me, I created separate journals with separate topics. You know, so I had one for self-esteem, self-love, uh, unpacking baggage. I had it for everything. I'm like, oh my God, I had all these issues. But I worked on all of those issues. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm feeling better. I'm good. And so now, instead of me negatively handling my issues, when things trigger me, I don't even know, mm-hmm. I don't even know things or people triggered me until I started mm-hmm. with therapy and guided journaling. So once I learned that, I was like, okay, now I know what to do. So, you know, I recognized that I had negative coping skills, which was what? Overeating, um, drinking, alcohol, or doing, you know, drugs, illegal drugs. And, you know, those things are temporary. And they, yep. they, they feel good at the moment, but once all that, once you come back to reality, your issues are still there. So that's why, you know, I advocate for address your issues. You know, the whole process, it was not fun at all. Some of that shit I didn't want to admit because I was a problem in some of those issues that I had. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I did not want to face that. And so, but I had to in order to heal. My thing was I wanted to heal because I don't want to have another nervous breakdown. That shit wasn't fun at all. It was not. I didn't even know who I was. And through, you know, my talk therapy and guided journaling, this is a whole new person here. I mean, I'm the same Mm -hmm. person, but just a lot of layers have been peeled back. So, you know, I used to pride myself with being mean and, you know, people not, uh, me, me, me being unapproachable. Like, don't fucking talk to me because that's the face I had because I am with mm-hmm. you. Know I mean, and now I'm like, come talk to me. Come on. I can tell you something. You can learn something from me, you know, and I'm open. And, you know, I receive things a whole lot differently than I did before, from before. <laughs> so I am better, much, much better now. And I know how to deal with my triggers and my issues. And the Yeah, it sounds, it sounds like. You know, you've really gone through a tran- transformation through this healing, which is really amazing to hear about. Thank you. I did. You mentioned so many things that I think are themes within a lot of our families around this this stigma, around this notion that we don't tell people our business and we should be able to, you know, carry whatever it is. Mm -hmm. on our own or maybe relying on the one friend or the family member when especially if that friend or family member is doing the same thing like it's not a safe it's an echo chamber you know like we have our friends for a reason and they great for pump up they great for all sorts of stuff Mm -hmm. but sometimes we do need help outside of our friends and our family unbiased help (laughs) somebody Mm -hmm. you don't know who has been through what you've been through who can tell you the right way to get through it. And not, you know, oh, you know, take a couple of shots, you'll be all right. No, the hell you won't. I mean, you will for the moment, but you know, we, I'm trying to get people out of wanting that temporary relief. Don't you want your relief to be more permanent? I am sorry, somebody stole somebody's kids, so that's my Amber Alert going on. Oh my goodness. I understand. Somebody stole somebody's kid. Yeah, I hope they find their child. Most of the time, and you know, I, I I know this is so off subject, but most of the time when I look at these Amber Alerts, when I see the description of the Amber Alert, you could tell it's just some hot ass little girl who then ran away. You can tell. <laughs> you can tell. And I, I I swear I'll be right every time. That's what it means. <sighs> so there's some old ass man on the internet, and she then ran off with him. That's what it means. Yeah. And, yeah. like, and I think at least somebody noticed though to to file a missing persons, you know. Just because they little girl didn't come home from the weekend, she went spend the night at Deborah's house, and she ain't came home. And Deborah's mama say, "Oh no, she wasn't here. That's all it is." Okay, you got a whole story. <laughs> That's what it be. <laughs> and you know why I say that? Because I used to be like that. But nobody, <laughs> me too. Nobody ever had to call a file a missing person. I can always came home. Yeah, I lied about where I was going, but I came my ass home. But these days, these little girl don't want to come home. 
so many rules mm. out. <laughs> I came home one day and my dad was waiting for me. Ooh, like, that's the worst kind. <laughs> <laughs> that is the worst. Uh, okay. Yeah. Home, <laughs> but so, okay, I want to ask you about um, therapy because you went to three therapists. Yes. And frankly, <laughs> I don't know that I know a lot of people that would have stuck it out for three therapists to, they to just figure it out. And I know... You talked about you wanted to heal. You you were on a mission and you weren't going to stop until you found that healing. And I think that's that's wonderful. My question is, with the first two therapists, how did you know that they weren't a good fit for you? Um, the first therapist that I found, you know, first of all, I was already, I don't want to see no damn therapist, but, you know, I said, okay, let me just search. Cause I didn't know, I didn't have anybody to say, Hey, you know, a good therapist I can see, cause we don't see that. Right. So I right. had to find her on my own. So I went to Google and I said, okay, I want a black therapist. I knew I didn't want her to be too young and I knew I didn't want her to be, I didn't want her to be too old. So I said, okay, that narrows it down. So I found a couple. I actually went by their names. I said, okay, that's that's you sound like a nice person, you know, by her name. <laughs> I, I ain't know no better. And <laughs> so I found my first one. She was a black lady, went too old, went too young. I I want to say in the beginning, she was helping me. Mm. And then I think I saw her for maybe six months, I think. And I learned that she was seeing someone who I was seeing her about. So let's say you're a therapist and I go to you and say, oh, I'm having an issue with this person. But she's seeing that person too and didn't mm. tell me. Well, she can't though, can she? I mean, I don't think she can tell you. She shouldn't have took that person on as a damn client. But maybe she first. took you on second. Maybe she had the other person first. On first. Oh. She, she took me on. Yeah. No, she took me on first. And <laughs> um, I knew something was wrong. That's when we were still going in person. And normally I would go out the front door. But this time she had me go out the back door. I'm like, why am I going out the back door? She was like, oh, it's crowded in there. And I don't want to protect your privacy. I just want you to go this way. And my dumb ass fell for it. And then I learned, oh, you saying the same, bitch. I'm sitting up here talking. So you're getting two sides of the information. And no, that wasn't cool at all. It was not. And so she got fired. And mm. I did not leave quietly. I'm just going to leave it at that. Mm. So I went and found another therapist. So I said, okay, back to, and back to the drawing board. And you know what turns people off about having to go through therapists? You're going to have to tell the same story over and over again. Over and over yeah. and over. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the turn off. But nope, I went and found another therapist because I still knew I needed something. And um, I had one appointment with her. And she ghosted me. Instead of her, yeah, instead of her saying, okay, this is a little bit too much for me. I can't deal with you. Go find another therapist. No, she just quit. She quit taking my call. She quit responding to my messages, my email. Okay, little bitch, I got you. Okay. And mm -hmm. but, you know, I was mad. <laughs> I'm like, okay, is something wrong with me that nobody wants to help me? And I found my third therapist and I already had in my mind, okay, she's going to leave. She's going to be like the rest of these. Right who left me and I told her I said I I'm gonna talk to you but I know you're gonna leave me she never left <laughs> she mm. did not give up on me and I gave her hell when I tell you I gave her hell it wasn't just easy you know no I gave her hell probably for about three or four months and then I realized okay she is helping me she's really trying to help me so yeah um you have to go you have to understand that therapists work for you not the other way around. So if you are not comfortable with your therapist, buy the ass and find another one. Mm -hmm. What's that? You know, because, yeah, that first one, she was out of line, out of line. And the second one, she was out of line, too. And she was she was a black lady, and she, she was younger than me, but not too much younger. Mm -hmm. And then my third one, she's a little bit younger than me. 
and now you know and i still talk to her every now and again and she um she offered me she was my therapist for a whole year whole 12 months and at that 12 month mark she was like okay i'm gonna have to let you go now <laughs> no no it was like a breakup i was crying mm. it was like she was like no you have the tools that you need you know what to do i need you to use them don't use me as a crutch and that's what you're you're doing if i keep continue with you after 12 months we'll check in every few months but no you need to go and be on your own and oh my god i was devastated like oh my god she's leaving me she's breaking up but she was right though so mm. and when I hear about people being in therapy for like 10, 12 years for the same issue, your therapist taking your money. <laughs> they are. Or it's like me and we've switched from therapy to coaching. That's because di- That's different. Cause yeah, because I, I do feel like, so I've stayed with my therapists. I've had several and I've stayed with each of them, you know, until... Frankly, I've like moved from the place. I haven't like stopped seeing a therapist because at some point I didn't feel like they were right for me or anything like that. Usually it's I've left or like just maybe got tired with therapy and then stopped therapy altogether yeah. for that period. I get it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's funny. There's, uh, I'm sure there's a podcast or a show that's like all <laughs> about therapy drama because while I'm a, I love therapy, like I'm an advocate for therapy, I've had some therapists. I've had one, to no fault of her own, me and an ex-boyfriend both went to a group relationship mm. therapy session. Mm. And we were the only two that showed up. And we didn't know oh, wow. that each other were going. But we lived in the same community. And so it wound up being like a post-breakup couple's counseling session it was awful because i mean he told me some stuff i didn't want to hear about myself we'll we'll just leave it like that um but then i also had a therapist a white therapist um who i was going to see her through the eap program at work Mm -hmm. um because i had just moved to south georgia i was afraid i was having severe anxiety i was afraid that i was going to get lynched like I had lived, I'm from Seattle. I never lived in the South. I got down here and I was like, what am I doing? Like I'm a black woman driving around rural Georgia. I'm not safe here. So I did an EAP phone call appointment. They provided me with this therapist. I went to see this therapist. She was an older white lady. She asked me what I was there for. I told her and then she said, oh yeah, well, my husband's racist. Um, but I keep telling him that there are good ones. And I next needed to, to <laughs> pop my head to the side, to the side. I needed to take some deep breaths because similar to your experience, like I still thought I was going to be injured. Like mm-hmm. my anxiety was not going away. And I didn't feel like I had the luxury to go find somebody else at that moment. So I saw her. I continued to see her for the three. I got three free appointments. I continued to see her. Um, But I'll also say she was the person that I was seeing at the time when my now husband texted me. I was in her office. He texted me for our first date. And I didn't know what to say because I'm freaking out that I'm going to die here in Georgia. Like, I think that I need to go move someplace else. And she's (laughs) like, go ahead and go on a date with him. So I went on a date. And now, what is this? Ten years, ten years later, it he's my good. husband. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, not every therapist is a good therapist. I think that's yeah. the moral of the story. Not every therapist has, um, you know, the value alignment isn't always there. The morality and the ethics are not always there. And so, we do have to be discerning yes. when we're choosing, like who we are going to be relying on to help get us through whatever situation it is that we're we're seeking support for. You know, I. When I refer people to therapists, I say, you know, find someone who looks like you, Mm -hmm. and you know, or has gone through what you've gone through. And you can ask, you can ask your therapist, you know, questions. Don't be afraid to ask them questions about them and their background. You know, if they are who they say they are, they're they're not going to mind answering. And you have Mm -hmm. those therapists who are therapists only because they went to school to be a therapist. And then you have those therapists who went through something 
and also went to school, you know, so they can combine their lived experience with their learned ex experience to help. So you can ask. And I always say your therapist should have a therapist because, okay, you're going to your therapist, you're dumping on them. Where are they putting that, in, where are they putting that energy? They should have yeah. a therapist. So your therapist should have a therapist and or a coach. And if they yeah. don't, get rid of them. <laughs> and one of the things that I appreciate about what you've shared with me um, offline mm -hmm. about your coaching practice is that you only see people who are experiencing things that you've been through. Exactly. And I think that that that's almost counterculture, not almost, that is, I think, counterculture to what we are taught as people going into some of these professions that like, either like, it's fine if you've had that experience, but you don't necessarily want to tell people, you know, you don't want to get too personal with the people that you're, um, who are your clients. And I, in, in my profession as an attorney, I've been told, you know, basically don't share your information. And just, you know, you're their attorney, you're not their friend, you're not their therapist, you're not whoever. Yeah. And, you know, for some of us, it's really difficult to like, because to me, that means I'm leaving part of myself someplace else. And that part of myself could be really helpful to this person. Exactly, which is why I share my lived experience. I only coach on my lived experience. And I have learned experience. That's why I have the certification. But the certification, the learned experience has taught me how much to divulge or, right. you know, to, for me to learn who I'm talking to and what, what, and Right, um, recognize with how much they're able to take. You know, I could just be general or I can get down and dirty. It just depends mm -hmm. on the person. So, no, I mean, I don't want to talk to someone who hasn't gone through what I've gone through. Yeah. How are you going to help me? Right. How do you know that what you're suggesting that I do is even applicable here? Exactly. Like, is this even a good idea? Yeah, exactly. That's why, you know, if someone comes to me and has gone through something that I haven't, I refer them out because I don't want to, you know, tell you anything wrong because I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I only want Fair to enough. know on what I know. I know what I know. And if I don't yeah. know it, I am adult enough to say, oh, I don't know this, but let me find you someone who does. Right. You know, my goal is to for you to get the help that you need. It's not yeah. about, you know, money or accolades or whatever. No, I want you go. I don't ever want anyone to ever go through what I went through ever that it was not. It wasn't. It wasn't it. Mm. <laughs> it was not. So that's my objective is to help you as much as I can within my capabilities. And if I'm unable, you know, I, I then I refer you. I have a network of therapists, other coaches, and I, hey, can you take this person? This person has the, you know, I, that's what I do. Yeah. So speaking of what you know, I'd love to hear about your journals because you have a line of journals. Yes. Um, and so tell us about those and tell us where we can find those journals. So those journals that I was talking about when I was going through my healing process, I made separate journals for every issue I went through. And once I saw they were working for me, I was like, well, you know, okay, maybe somebody else could use this because I was just going to stop at that. I had no intentions on going into a business at all. I had no intentions on Shanti Refuge Journals. I had no intentions on coaching anybody. But, um, you know, I, I, I really want to say that mm -hmm. God told me, hey, okay, you're okay. What about these people? There's mm -hmm. somebody else out there who wants the same thing that you wanted. You wanted to heal and not be medicated because we all know medication does not heal you. It only shuts you up. It stabilizes your mood. But what about getting to the root of it, you know? So I was like, okay, all right, you know? So I, I made them all pretty and I sent them off to a uh, ship, you know, to a um, manufacturer so they can print them because I didn't have the capability to, you know, print. And uh, I started got on social media and said, hey, you know, my name is Shanti. I, you know, I tell a little bit of my story and how these guided journals helped me. They really helped me. And, you know, um, they did. They really did. And I'm glad that I went into business because a lot of people come to me and say, 
oh my god thank you so much for this thank you for what you're doing this helped me blah blah, blah. and that that's rewarding to me to be able to help someone else to get through the stuff that i wish i had these you know when i was going through it <laughs> you know yeah it, yeah, and I'm someone, um, I don't like journaling, but I love questionnaires. So <laughs> guided journaling yes. makes a lot of sense for me because, like, I don't know, I guess when I'm just journaling without a prompt, it just feels like, like, what am I writing and why? Exactly. It's very intimidating, especially to someone who isn't big on journaling. You know, mm -hmm. you know people have journal trauma that I learned, you know, because... Oh, girl, <laughs> you said journal trauma. I know exactly what you're talking about, but go ahead. <laughs> you know, how when we used to keep a diary as a kid and somebody got a hold of the start reading our business. So, you know, trauma from that or trauma from your English uh, teacher making you journal, that journal thingy on the board, you have to journal about it and you have to do it in a certain way. And I, yeah, that's what... Cursive. Yeah, oh my God, yeah, they don't even teach that anymore. And <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that's why I make it as simple because it's not homework. I don't ever want my guided journals to feel like homework. It is not homework. This is something you pick up when you feel like it. You answer the, you don't even have to think because the question is there. Just answer right. it truthfully. As long as you're honest, responding to that question, you will be surprised what's going to come out of you, stuff that you didn't even know was there. Wow. So where can we get these journals? <laughs> you could get my journals at ShantiRefugeJournals.com. Um, you can, if you're not sold on journaling yet, follow me on uh, social media, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. I am Shanti Refuge Journals. And, you know, I post content about journaling all the time and mm -hmm. how it benefits your mental health. Yeah. Okay, before I let you go, I have one final question for you, and that is, what is your affirmation or mantra that you rely on this season? This season, I am saying mm -hmm. to myself every day that I love you, I thank you, I'm sorry, I forgive you. I say that every day. Mm. I love you, I thank you. That's I'm deep. Sorry, I forgive you, yeah. And I look in the mirror and say it. Awesome. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today. I've enjoyed this conversation and, you know, it does make me want to go back and look at, cause, cause I have some journals that have prompts go. that I have not like spent time with. And so it's making me question like, okay, Whitney, are you ready to give this another, another try? Give it a try. Yeah. <laughs> give, it, give it a try. Where can it hurt? It can't. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> thank you, Shanti, for joining us. Winnie, thank you for having me. Thanks so much for joining me for this conversation. I hope that you got as much out of it as I did. Feel free to continue the conversation with us over on Facebook at the Impostrix Podcast Validating Space. We welcome all, and it's a space for us to validate each other as we work through work, race, and imposter syndrome. You can find out more about me or about the podcast at www.impostrixpodcast.com. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Podcast. Until next time, be validated.